Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tank. My name is Alan. The Star Wars Galaxy is a massive place. There are millions of planets, thousands of trade routes, and dozens of economic centers. There are also endless amounts of trade agreements and restrictions, tariffs, blockades, wars, and rivalries. This, of course, all leads to spikes and dips in demands for all sorts of products, which leads to endless amount of opportunities for the self-employed freight captain, who in many ways is the true hero of Star Wars. In a galaxy full of religious cults and low-paying wage jobs, the independent freight captain can earn a good middle-class salary and perhaps even strike it rich if they can buy for cheap enough and sell for a large enough amount of profit. The risk and reward is even higher for individuals willing to dabble in the smuggling of illicit goods. Depending on what you're hauling, some illegal shipments can net you enough profit for an early retirement. As per usual on this channel, we're just trying to give you guys some valuable information. What you choose to do with that information, legal or not, is completely your business. And so without further ado, here are the 10 best ships you can use for smuggling in the Star Wars Galaxy. We're going to be starting off this list with a manufacturer that will have many entries on this list, Carillion Engineering Corporation. This was a massive Carillion-based manufacturer that has cornered the small and mid-sized ship market, including light freighters. CEC not only builds large enough to scale to make their ships extremely affordable, they also emphasize that their ships are supposed to be modded with aftermarket parts. In many ways, a CEC freighter comes as an empty box. It's fully functional, but you really won't get the most out of it until you add some personal touches to it. And when it comes to modular freighters, there's no starship more popular and customizable in the CEC line than the Gazanti class light cruiser. I like to think of it as the sprinter van of the Star Wars galaxy. Since its creation, almost every major government in the galaxy has used it, from the Separatist Alliance, to the Galactic Republic, to even the Galactic Empire. It's also a favorite amongst criminal enterprises and independent captains as well. The Gazanti has many different modifications and variants. The one we'll be talking about today is the CEC factory spec, known as CROC, or Configuration Restored Operational Capacity. This variant was specifically built with cargo hauling in mind. It was rolled out by CEC as a midlife upgrade for first-generation Gazanti-class cruisers. It involved significant changes to the hull structure, which increased the volume of the cargo hold, and an additional three sublight engines were added to increase the speed of the vessel. The original Gazanti-class light cruiser had very underwhelming uh, sublight engines, and this was because regulators didn't want it to be used by pirates, which of course happened anyway. The Sea Rock variant also had outrigger cargo trays that allowed the ship to quickly take on cargo crates and just as quickly jettison them into a black hole because, I don't know, maybe some custom officer has just boarded your ship. Ultimately though, what made this ship so popular was its bang for the buck. At 190,000 credits, a Gazante class light cruiser was worth about the same as an X-Wing, yet it was 74 meters long and could carry up to 4,000 metric tons of goods. And although the Gazante class cruiser usually had a full crew of up to 12 individuals, it could still be operated by one skilled pilot. You might have never heard of Go Truck Industries. It's a lot more popular in the outer rim than it is in the inner rim. The Go Truck 720 Light Freighter series was a response to the CEC's YT series. The 720 light freighter lacked firepower and only had one laser turret, and the crew quarters within the ship were known to be a little bit uncomfortable. But the 720 light freighter could carry up to 135 metric tons in its two main cargo holds, which was 35 metric tons more than a YT-1300 freighter. The 720 light freighter, like CEC's products, was designed to be highly customizable and would become quite popular amongst outer rim smugglers. Ray Skywalker actually learned how to fly starships on a 720 freighter simulator. And during the last battle between the Final Order and the Resistance, at least one 720 joined Lando's fleet. The VCX-100 freighter was one of the best designs created by Carillion Engineering Corporation. 
Unlike the YT-1300, which had an offset cockpit for uh, hauling around freight crates and everything like that, the VC-X100 light freighter was built symmetrically with a cockpit in the center of the airframe. This made it a relatively easy ship to fly, and thanks to its powerful engines and laser turrets, it made the VC-X essentially a very formidable and agile gunboat. Equipped with a Class II hyperdrive and capable of hauling a decent amount of product, the VCX also had room for a few crewmates in its staterooms, which could also double as a storage compartment. In the hands of an experienced pilot like Harris and Dula, the VCX 100 Life Freighter could do a lot of damage to other lighter ships. This small freighter also had a VSX series auxiliary starfighter that was a fully functioning shuttle. It could actually protect the VCX-100 from other enemy starfighters, or it could take a ground team away on a mission or in an emergency situation serve as an escape pod. The rebel group known as Spectre Cell was famous for using a VCX-100 light freighter known as the Ghost. The Hawk 290 light freighter was vastly different from other CEC products. For one, it wasn't boxy or crescent shaped. It almost looks like an X-Wing or some other type of starfighter, but this was in fact a light freighter designed by CEC to target more wealthy merchants and politicians. At 39 meters in length though, it was probably a little too large to call it a true starfighter, although it did have the maneuverability of a starfighter. It was on par with something like a U-Wing. The Hawk 290 Life Freighter was also equipped with a Class II hyperdrive proton torpedoes, incendiary bombs, heavy lasers, and it could carry up to 75 metric tons. The shields on this ship, however, were quite light, so the pilot usually depended on speed and firepower to survive situations. Nubian designed starships are amongst the most beautiful and sleek looking vessels in the galaxy. Their designs are curvaceous and feature very few right angles and are always covered in chromium. They're more works of art than just mere ships and they usually are powered by clean burning plasma thrusters. And they are extremely expensive, usually reserved only for the richest industrialists or just Nabu royalty. But as I said before, depending on what you smuggle, I mean, your profit margins could be massive and ridiculous. So does it really matter how much money you spend on a ship? And for some high-end smugglers, a ship like the J-Type 326 Nubian Starship is worth the purchase because of the image it brings to the owner. You're much less likely to be stopped by customs agents and imperial officers if they think you're a part of high society. And the J-Type 327 Nubian Starship gives off exactly that kind of vibe. Sure, you might have to hire a crew and a chef and some stewardess to pamper you, but if that means the large shipment of spice in your hold stays safe, well, I guess it's worth it. Next up, we have an entry from Core Galaxy Systems, which was a manufacturer that was quite popular during the Old Republic era. They were known for manufacturing the Dynamic Class Freighter. From a configuration and even design standpoint, this looks quite a lot like the YT series Corellian Freighter, but it actually is not. For one, this era of ships usually favored cockpits with much smaller transparent steel windows for protection. And while the hole on the ship is crescent shaped, the cockpit is center aligned here on the Dynamic Class. Also, the Dynamic Class Freighter was a very limited production ship. As a matter of fact, only one Dynamic Class Freighter was built at a time. These ships were specifically designed to be heavily upgraded and modified. With a relatively small cargo capacity of 60 metric tons, the Dynamic Class Freighter is not going to be something you use to haul massive amounts of goods. Instead, you're going to have to focus on less amounts of goods that are higher quality and higher priced. It's said that the Dynamic Class Freighter would go on to inspire CEC's future line of light freighters. The Fallen Jedi Revan used a Dynamic Class Freighter known as the Ebon Hawk during his journey, which brought quite a lot of fame to the platform. This next ship is going to be outside of the budget for most smugglers out there, and even if you do have enough money, you're still going to have to contact Senior Fleet Systems. You're probably going to have to have a very good connection with the Republic military before they allow you to check out their state-of-the-art technology. You see, the IPv2C Stealth Corvette was not only invisible to sensors, but even to the naked eye, thanks to its active cloaking measures. This allowed the IPv2C to infiltrate any system and bypass any blockade with relative ease. 
something that every smuggler would like to have available. Even though the ship is 99 meters in length, its cargo space is a bit limited because of the narrow stick-like shape of the space frame. And while in stealth mode, the IPv2C is quite vulnerable and is unable to use its weapons. I routinely they used to make fun of the GR-75 transport mainly because of its poor performance. The ship is ridiculously slow and basically unarmored, and it has a class 4 hyperdrive, which makes even hyperspace travel seem kind of slow. Yet the GR-75 has always been a very popular ship, especially amongst independent operators and rebels. The GR-75 cost a thousand credits less than the Gazanti class cruiser and could hold more than four times the amount of cargo. This ship is basically an empty shell which is designed to store stuff with maximum efficiency. It just happens to have a few engines bolted onto its body. This allows you to really scale up what you're hauling. I mean, you could even go legit with this vessel. Or 99% legit. Just make sure you stay in civilized space lanes because uh, you're not going to want to run into some pirates in this vessel. The G9 Rigger was a smaller CEC product at only 34.1 meters in length. It utilized a Class 3 hyperdrive and was equipped with a few light lasers. With a cargo capacity of around 70 tons, it wasn't known for hauling large amounts of goods, but it was commonly used by the Hutt Cartel for spice shipping. During the Clone Wars, Anakin Skywalker would commandeer a G9 Rigger during the Battle of Teth. He would go on to use this ship on multiple missions where a Jedi Starfighter would have drawn too much attention. Like most CEC products, the G9 Rigger was easy to work on and would serve as a project ship for the Jedi to tinker with for the next several years. The YT-1300 had to make it on this list because one of the most famous smugglers in the world, Han Solo, and another very famous rogue, Lando Calrissian, both utilized one of these vessels, specifically the Millennium Falcon. This 34.75 meter long dish-shaped vessel was first built to tow large freight containers into orbit. This is why the cockpit is offset and there is a gap in front of the ship where the vessel could dock with boxes. The interior of the YT-1300 can be customized easily to include hidden smuggling compartments, which makes it a favorite of the smugglers. And because this ship was designed mainly for industrial hauling, it had a superb frame that was designed to handle a large amount of stress and weight. This allows the ship to be easily upgraded with armored panels. So there you have it guys, those are 10 amazing smuggling ships. Let me know in the comment section below which one is your favorite. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.